If our money's purchasing power is increasing over time, then that means as time goes by, we have greater capacity to show up. People are working so hard, the cost of living is so expensive that people feel stuck. This is something that has really opened my eyes to seeing that we do have the potential for a rosy future. Whereas only a handful of years ago, I thought the world was quite a dark place. When a money is broken, it shapes society. And it shapes society in very negative ways. On a Bitcoin standard, we will have separated money from state. That means that the state or the government has to compete like any other business. If the government itself is not fiscally responsible, then it's going to wither away. And that allows another government that offers value that listens to the populace to rise up. Hey, look, this country's spending a lot of money on war. That must mean the populace supports war. But that's not the case. On a Bitcoin standard, if the populace do not support war and they withhold paying taxes, that government can no longer go and fund wars and that government walks quickly wither away and another one will rise up. If you've got a pure free market, then ultimately it could end up like Mad Max. When we start looking at the world through the lens of Bitcoin, all of a sudden, hey, I want to save in this thing because over time, my cost of living goes down in relation to Bitcoin. As time goes by, as the pain increases, at some point, the pain to hold on to our long-held beliefs, our, our world beliefs, becomes lesser than the pain that we are immediately feeling in terms of, hey, I can't even afford to feed my family right now. You, you were not in Prague, right? You're from America. No, I, I, I live in the small little ski town of Whistler, uh, north of Vancouver in Canada. And I, I wanted to make it to Prague so badly. Prague in just in general terms as a city is just such an incredible city. But I'd love to make it to Prague one of these days. It's just a it's like a nine hour flight. Yeah, it's it's one of those. I hear that a lot. I, I, I'm only in Prague for like, this is my only big conference I go, at, at least till now. Uh, but the feedback I get is like, it's one of the only conferences that's like really Bitcoin only. It's like the, this, this Bitcoin thing and not like, oh, there's also this, this small shitcoin things in, in, in the Bitcoin conference. So I like that, but I've not been to other Bitcoin conferences. I have uh, to say, so we uh, earlier in the year, I had the opportunity to go to Madeira for uh, Bitcoin Atlantis. And that was unbelievable i've never been to uh any of the bitcoin miami any of the big big conferences and so even just to be a bitcoin uh atlantis in madeira was such an incredible opportunity and andre the guy who uh, kind of founded and kind of set up the whole event did such a phenomenal job yeah there's something there's something about just hanging out with bitcoiners that is just so refreshing i feel like the world at which we live in unfortunately people are very scared to voice their opinions. And when it comes to Bitcoiners, I feel like people have done a lot of work trying to formulate their opinions and they're open in their opinions. And so you can have these phenomenal conversations. And even if you disagree with someone, you're you're open to kind of pushing it back a little bit. You're open to having that kind of debate, but it's, it's very friendly. And so I, I always value Bitcoiners. I also saw uh, that Bitcoiners are more likely to actually find common ground. I have this conversation, this, this one example that I brought up a few times in the podcast where I sat at a Bitcoin conference or a Bitcoin meetup, actually, like there were like hundred people or something like that. And there was in front of me a vegan and a carnivore. Like the one, the one, the one was actually like, oh, I only want to eat meat. The other one was like a raw vegan, uh, so, which was really interesting to see. And the conversation was so loving and, and so respectful. And they kind of agreed like, oh, fresh food is good and make it uh, homemade food. Like they, they tried to find out like common ground. And, and this is kind of where, where we might end up with a Bitcoin standard because all of a sudden when, when Bitcoin is the global standard, uh, which is a very, very, very long uh, way. But when we have this global standard, do you think also that like Bitcoin could unite us or because there's also this, this view where like, ah, oh, Bitcoin is just money in the end of the day. It, it does not shit, does not do shit for, for our society. But, uh, how do you see that? I, I, whole, I wholeheartedly agree. I think that what is so fascinating about Bitcoin is just in, in simplistic terms, <clears throat> if our money's purchasing power is increasing over time, then that means as time goes by, we have greater capacity to show up. And if we have greater capacity to show up, then we can more consciously think about the content we're consuming. And so I think that people are going to be a lot more aware of the content they're consuming and formulating their, opin uh, their opinions. And not only that, I think that it makes for a world where people tend to align more on truth. And at the same time, people, given that they've formulated their opinions and they, they understand the research they've, they've done, They're also opening to have and they're open to having debates because they always say, what is the famous saying? It's like uh, truth is open to being questioned. Lies cannot. And so I think many times when we formulate our opinions off mainstream media, when we haven't done the research ourselves, the moment someone questions our belief and we cannot really articulate it or explain it in the way that we want to be able to or to 
to the the ability to be able to really go deep, all of a sudden our ego arises and we start to shut down the conversation. And so I think that that's one of the challenges we find in society today is that people are working so hard, the cost of living is so expensive that people feel stuck. They can't necessarily go and spend as much time researching into the things they're passionate about to the extent that they may be able to on say a Bitcoin standard. And so people have these these very strong opinions, but they're not really based on anything. And it's really hard to see this happen. And there's, there's a lot of divisiveness in society. Yeah, it's, it's, it, I see it uh, with, with Swiss because Swiss is so close to us. And when, when you hear Germans or other people that are close to Swiss talking about Swiss people, there's like, ah, it's a little bit slower in Swiss. Uh, they're a little bit more um, relaxed and, and laid back in, in Swiss, but obviously not everybody, but in general, it, it is true. Like you come to the Swiss country, it's beautiful. And, and the, you, you, you notice that like they're the closest to the gold standard. They, they are the last ones who go off the gold standard, which is uh, really interesting for me to, to see. Uh, and it's kind of like what, what happens when people get their time back with the family for research, for everything. Uh, and not it li uh, living in this hectic world where like have to paycheck for paycheck and and you have to kind of make a living and then you have to a second or third job and you try to to do it all uh, and what happens when you can just actually like lay back and just read a book and actually research or spend time with your family i think this is also i have a lot of compassion with people that don't get bitcoin because all of often times they just don't have a time to actually research about the topic mm -hmm. They're, mm -hmm. they're having two jobs and they, they don't like they, they don't have the time to research a uh, hundred or a thousand hours, which sometimes Bitcoin is saying, ah, oh, you need at least hundred hours to understand Bitcoin. But they, most people don't have this time. It's, it's, it's interesting you bring that up because I think that the way I like to think th to look at things is in, in psychology, you've got Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And on the base of our, this pyramid uh, of needs is our basic security needs. We need food and we need shelter. And it's very hard for us to start thinking about these upper needs, such as like compassion and altruism or relationships, or even getting up to self-actualization, spiritual beliefs, <clears throat> if we do not have our base needs met. If we do not have our base needs met of, of food and shelter, then we kind of get stuck in this low level of just trying to fend for ourselves. And I think that when I look at Bitcoiners, it really has blown my world view wide open because I think going into the pandemic, I was very scared. I felt like the world felt like a very dark place. The world felt like the trajectory we were on is that increasingly people are just trying to meet their basic needs and people aren't, they don't have the capacity to think for themselves. They don't have the capacity to give back. They don't have the capacity to support community. And then you look at Bitcoiners and Bitcoiners are having kids. They're trying to do what they can for the community. They're having increased amount of time to uh, meet their own emotional needs, their kids' emotional needs, societal needs uh, as time goes by. And I, th I think this is something that has really opened my eyes to seeing that we do have the potential for a rosy future. Whereas only a handful of years ago, I, I thought the world was quite a dark place. And so I think that it's so cool to see this cohort of individuals that are coming together but they're also seeing on a behavioral level that money is actually changing how they're showing up in the world, which is profound. Is, is that, uh, I think you have to book uh, the, the hidden cost of money. Uh, my first actual question for, for the podcast would be today, uh, what, what is the, the hidden cost of money? And I guess there's like two answers to that. Like first is like your book and, and what is there, but like you get that ask a lot, I guess, what, like what is the hidden cost of money? What are you describing in your book? For sure. So I ended up, I, I would say, and it, it, it's, it, I'm trying to just uh, figure out how far back do I want to go. I'll, I'll, I'll just start with the book. <clears throat> I ended up basically recognizing that uh, when I entered the Bitcoin space, and I would say I really went deep down the rabbit hole in 2020, I've been interested in Bitcoin and watching all the documentaries, you name it, but I hadn't really gone down the rabbit hole and grasped the significance of Bitcoin until about 2020. And so in the last kind of four to five years, it really has sunk in as to the importance of money. I think a lot of us see money as just this medium of exchange, this thing we exchange back and forth to be able to go buy groceries, to go buy a car, to be able to pay for our rent. But we don't think about what are the costs of money? If we have a money that doesn't meet societal needs, it doesn't meet the user's needs, what are the costs of this? And so 
going down this Bitcoin rabbit hole, I felt as if there were many books that described uh, the technical aspects. If you want to go and read Antonopoulos, if you wanted to go into the, the philosophical, you can go read Breedlove. If the corporate, you've got Sailor. And you, you do have Seyfedeen's books, which I think start to touch on some of these subjects, but they approach it quite academically. And so I really like to try and speak to the layperson as to how money weaves its influence into all of these aspects of our society. So how does it impact how I show up as an individual and my behavior? How does it impact the environment? How does it impact politics? How does it impact businesses? And so ultimately, the whole goal of the hidden cost of money was to break down this thing called money to really show individuals that money is incredibly important in society. Not so much in that we can buy and sell and buy the things we need to, but in that when a money is broken, it shapes society and it shapes society in very negative ways. When a money meets our needs, it shapes society in positive ways. And so being able to see how different types of money can shape society in, in, in different ways is, is incredibly important. And that's where ultimately it ends on Bitcoin and what a world underneath a Bitcoin standard may look like. Because I think when you really go down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, that's when you start recognizing, my God, this thing has the potential to change how we show up in life. It gives us greater capacity to look inwards and ask the questions like, who am I and how do I want to show up? Because I think, unfortunately, in today's world, because money is losing purchasing power, because our cost of living is rising and it's getting harder and harder to get ahead, people increasingly are losing their authenticity. They don't know who they are, how they want to show up. And I think that's a problem. We're losing uh, our ability to show up authentically in society. Does this uh, Bitcoin world, uh, in the end of the day, when everything is deflationary, we're getting better in producing stuff and we have sound money that uh, kind of enables everything, uh, lead to a world where we have an abundant system, where we have like this, uh, we can actually build on top of what we already have built and we can concentrate on on bigger things. I'm also thinking a lot about zombie companies right now. I feel like uh, this money printing enables a lot of um, empty companies that don't do actually a lot or even in companies that do something. There's like 10% of people that actually do something and 90% of people that are just there. And I saw that in the corporate world where I, I worked be before that. Uh, how do you see, how do you see that? It's interesting because you can kind of look at it from two different perspectives. The way that I see it, the first perspective is and and to your question, which is, um, do you see under a Bitcoin world kind of this abundance? And the first perspective is that I think, unfortunately, in our world today, because money is losing value, we are incentivized to consume given that our purchasing power is greatest in this present moment. So we have this society where we have a very consumerist society and you see it across social media. People are always trying to buy the next greatest thing, the newest iPhone, the, the, the newest Nikes. They, they, want to look, uh, they want to look the part. They want to fit in with society. They want to conform. And so the challenge is we have a society that unfortunately has shifted our view on what we believe happiness is. Happiness, we believe, is this external thing where if I go and purchase these things, if I go and purchase these shoes, if I go and get the nice car, then I'm going to be happy. But it's very fleeting. Unfortunately, when we go and purchase something, that's not happiness. Happiness is something when we contribute to society, when we challenge ourselves, when we connect with others, we build relationships. And so what I think is interesting on a Bitcoin standard is that when our money is worth more over time, all of a sudden it shifts, and Bitcoiners will know this term, it shifts our time preference. It shifts our ability to start thinking long term. Given that our purchasing power is worth more in the future, we start to think about prosperity. We start to think about security. We start to think about the future. That gives us a great capacity to think, okay, if I'm thinking about the future, how do I want to show up? And so what ends up happening, I believe, on a Bitcoin standard is that when we talk about abundance, I think we have abundance in that we have greater time to meet our internal needs. And so we have greater abundance and happiness and joy, not because we're purchasing consumerist goods, but because we have greater capacity to contribute with society, to challenge ourselves, to build relationships. And that abundance and happiness is huge. And then secondly, you can also look at it kind of from maybe how most people approach it, which is that unfortunately today, we've got so much inefficiency in society. When money is losing value over time, everyone is just trying to get what they can. Businesses are trying to get as much grants, they're trying to get subsidies, they're trying to basically just grow as quickly as possible against a system that's slowly imploding in on itself. And so I think that <clears throat> we have a lot of inefficiency, we have a lot of wastage. When you look at the government, the government, given that it's got a money printer, it can pay above average wages. So the in the, in the US alone, 
the average public job pays 10% more than the private sector job. So over time, the, the government is slowly engulfing the private sector, but the government doesn't have any incentive to be fiscally responsible given that it's got a money printer. It's not really competing on a free market basis. And so we've got this very inefficient, cumbersome system that is, we don't really have abundance. It's getting harder and harder and harder to get by. We're seeing massive wealth inequality, house prices are skyrocketing. And because of this, people are struggling. Whereas I think on a Bitcoin standard, and as most Bitcoiners uh, would tend to agree, is that if we've got purchasing power that's increasing over time, we have greater capacity to show up and meet our own personal needs. But not only that, and this is something that I think is so incredibly uh, like, like motivating, is that when we have a money that acts as a store of value, all of a sudden we're incentivized to save again. And if we're incentivized to save again, what's going to happen? All of a sudden, money isn't just going to go flood into all of these other investment uh, vehicles to try and escape debasement. It's not going to flood into real estate. It's not going to go and flood into uh, equities. It's not going to flood into the bond market. So we'd see trillions of dollars exit those traditional uh, asset types back into the currency, given that we can simply just save in the currency. And if we can simply just save in the currency, what ends up happening is our cost of living is cheaper, not only because of as technology advances, as efficiency increases, as productivity uh, increases, uh, we see costs fall, but also because at the moment house prices are elevated because people are just trying to flee the currency. If people are able to simply save in the currency, house prices would be a hell of a lot cheaper. And so I think that life becomes easier, life becomes more abundant simply because our cost of living, our, th uh, our ability to purchase things that allow us to thrive will be cheaper. And that, that I think is an incredible future to live in. I even mentioned uh, the government and I'm a, a lot thinking about that. What do you imagine the role of government or centralized organizations like a government? Uh, a lot of people, a lot of Bitcoin are also like it could be optional. And, but we have maybe a centralized organization where you can pay uh, them to make the streets, to make hospitals, whatever. Uh, but it's an optional service. And if you really want to go on the streets, then you have to pay for that. How do you see like on a, on a Bitcoin standard, uh, on, on a sound money standards, the role of government? It's interesting. I think there's many Bitcoiners that look at this very differently. Uh, some of them are more anarcho-capitalists. So they don't necessarily believe there is a role for government and that we don't need a government and that a free market has the ability to self-organize. And I think the free market has the ability to self-organize to a certain extent, but I'm not so sure. I, I, I tend to lean towards there is a role for government, but government right now is far too cumbersome far too big. And given that government has a money printer, it can fund operations without support from the populace. And so I think the way that I envision it is that first off, if we were living on a Bitcoin standard, we will have separated money from state. That means that the state or the government has to compete like any other business. If the government itself is not fiscally responsible, then it's going to wither away because it's not going to be able to service its debt obligations. It's not going to service its, its, its employee wages, you name it. And so it's going to quickly wither away. And that allows another government that offers value that listens to the populace to rise up. And that's how a free market has been operating uh, since the dawn of time. If you've got one company and they've got, the, or if you've got two companies and they're, they're creating the same product and one is offering a better product, then what will happen is that product, will, that company will rise up and the other one will wither away. We don't allow that to happen in an interventionistic system because we bail out companies, we give subsidies to companies, we give favorable terms to certain companies. And so we ultimately distort this free market. And it's the same thing with government. When you have a money printer, that money printer allows the government, as I mentioned, to fund operations without support from the populace. So we find ourselves in these societies that unfortunately don't really meet the needs of the populace. So I think what will happen under a Bitcoin standard is that if a government is not being fiscally responsible, it has the potential to wither away. But not only that, if the populace do not agree with what the government is doing, if they were to simply just like withhold paying taxes, the government also cannot fund itself. And this is incredibly important. I think about it in terms of war. At the moment, unfortunately, I do not support war as an individual. But the government, given that it can devalue the currency, it can then go and fund war at my expense as a currency holder, regardless of whether or not I support war. And so on the grand scheme of things, you look at a country and it says, hey, look, this country is spending a lot of money on war. That must mean the populace supports war. But that's not the case. On a Bitcoin standard, if the populace do not support war and they withhold paying taxes, that government can no longer 
go and fund wars and that government will quickly wither away and another one will rise up. And so I think that it flips the incentives in society. Not only that, and I'll add one more point, <clears throat> which is with Bitcoin, it's the first time in history we've ever had what's called like a non-jurisdictionally -ju uh, based asset, which I mean, it, which what that means is basically every other asset is either tangible, like real estate, it is physically located. That means that it can be seized quite easily or it is digital. If you're holding cash in the bank, if you're holding equities, if you're holding bonds, they're digital, but they're held by a third party, which again means that the government can seize those assets quite easily. When it comes to Bitcoin, it is digital, but it's non-jurisdictionally based and we can take custody of that, that asset ourselves. So it's not really existing in any jurisdiction. It's just in the digital realm of things. And that means that value can now flow to where value is being created. If my government is not offering a favorable jurisdiction for me to live in, I can walk across a border stark naked with 12 to 24 words in my head and the government has no idea that I'm moving my value with me. And so if money and, and value can effectively move to where value is being created, then it incentivizes value creation. It incentivizes governments. If they cannot seize that, that capital easily, well, then what do they have to do? They have to offer value. So they have to change the way they're approaching their populace. And that is profound. And we're seeing that already with, with countries like El Salvador. We're seeing that with countries that are adopting Bitcoin and showing a favorable jurisdiction because capital is flowing towards them. And I think in time, this will start to play a big role in how we see these larger nation states changing their behavior. Because if they can't take things by force, well, then they have to offer value. And I think the, in, in this, uh, and even uh, like, Money is the one part, like if you can take your money wherever you want to go and deploy your uh, capital wherever you want to go. But there's another part to it, which is like the second big revolution where we're kind of in with the internet revolution, uh, where all of a sudden there are remote jobs. There are like, uh, we can do the podcast remotely, which was not in that quality possible just like a 10, 20 years ago. So like e e even from a work perspective uh, and then also from a capital perspective, this kind of eliminates the those those borders because people can just like live anywhere like i'm now kind of working online only uh, i'm doing a lot of physical stuff but all, all the things i do in austria i can easily just start in any country where there are other, other bitcoiners uh, so that's like pretty easy for me to do and there are like m major other examples of that is do you see a future where like those 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 borders where we are like, oh, that's Austria, that's America, uh, that's Australia, that's Canada. Like the, those those borders are either getting bigger and, and to a bigger extent, or like maybe even like more localized or completely eliminated. This is a tough one, and I think it can go many different ways. Um, it's interesting. Last October, I went to Prospera in Honduras. And Prosper is a special economic zone. And for those that aren't familiar with a special economic zone, it's basically, you can think of it as a jurisdiction within inside, inside of like a host country. And so Prosper is inside of Honduras, but it has its own, it can basically control its borders to a certain extent, as long as it abides by the criminal code. And so it doesn't have to follow the same taxation profile as Honduras. It can kind of do what it wants inside its borders, as long as it abides by the criminal code. And that gives it a lot of autonomy to basically create a favorable location to draw uh, entrepreneurs in. And it was amazing to go to Honduras because all of a sudden they are, Bitcoin is their currency. You can go to any of the shops inside of um, Prospera and you can pay with Bitcoin, but you're also seeing Prospera influence. It's on the island of Roatan and you're also seeing Prospera inf influence a lot of the surrounding area outside of um, Prospera. And that's interesting because you're seeing local communities recognize that, hey, Bitcoin It's incredibly powerful, more so than the Honduran local currency. So we're going to start accepting Bitcoin. And so what I think will happen in time is I think these borders will still exist, but the borders won't be as confining as they have been up until now. And I also think that you're going to see much smaller uh, localities and much smaller jurisdictions that have their own rules and regulations, whereby it's a more optional opt-in system. And I think this is where you kind of get this mix of a um, anarcho-capitalist with kind of a democratic state, whereby the anarcho-capitalists believe that, okay, if you've got a pure free market, then ultimately 
it could end up like Mad Max. So we're going to create these more favorable jurisdictions, but the jurisdictions have a set of rules. And so if you want to come into our jurisdictions, you've got to play by our rules. And so I think that that is the potential to happen. You have these small localities that say, look, if you want to come into our small little locality, live in our little location, well, then you're going to pay this amount of a fee in order to be able to maintain the roads, pay for police, pay for infrastructure, you name it. And at the same time, this is going to be uh, the rules and regulations with inside this jurisdiction. But it's an opt-in system as opposed to a, uh, a system based upon force, which is our current taxation system. So it's, it's a tough one because I think it can go many different ways. But I see the borders will be less controlled as they are now, whereas we're going to have a lot more of these smaller little jurisdictions inside of these larger host states. And I think uh, you, you mentioned it, it needs rules to a certain extent. Like we, as, 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 as we're living in a society, we kind of like need um, um, to a certain extent rules. I, I try to com, uh, compare it always with, with soccer because it's right now in, in uh, the, the European championship and everything. But uh, in, in soccer, you also have like when someone steps out of the boundaries too much, uh, they get a fine. They maybe cannot uh, play anymore in the game. They maybe even get a fine, so they cannot play in like the following games. Uh, when they do something really rude or like really like in, endangering other players, uh, and to a certain extent, we we need those those kind of boundaries and and, and rules in in society so that we don't end up in a mess and don't end up in a chaos. The only question is like, how do we uh, enforce those rules and how can we uh, make sure those rules uh, and and those control and this monopoly on, on, on violence that we then kind of agree on uh, is not, um, how do you say, um, obscured or like, mm -hmm. I forgot the word of English. Like, it's like when it does not get, uh, uh, the, the wrong person is not getting to this power and then uh, getting to this power. And, and uh, I forgot this English word, sorry. <laughs> no, don't worry. I, 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 I grasp what you're trying to say. And I think that what is interesting is that rules are necessary. And I believe that unfortunately, the world that we live in is, is one in which people like to think of things in black and white. So you're either for intervention or you're against intervention. And there's nothing in between. Whereas I think um, for the way I view things is that it's a spectrum. At the moment, we have way too much intervention. I think we can do with way less intervention, but zero intervention is also not necessarily possible. And I think that intervention is something that happens in our day-to-day -day lives. We're intervening in each other's lives. And so what is intervention? And the way that I think about it sometimes on a grander scale is if you were to separate money from state, it's not as if the government cannot have a welfare state or it cannot intervene when we go into a recession. But what it does mean is that if the government wants to intervene, if we're going into a recession, well, what ends up happening is first, it has to save before that recession, it has to be fiscally responsible. And then when we go through a tough time, it is limited in its capacity to intervene, given that it can only intervene up until the point at which it has saved capital to intervene. And that means that it limits the ability for the government to basically change the natural order of things. And so when I think about it in terms of what does the future look like on a Bitcoin standard, rules are good. Intervention on its own is 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 not bad or good. It's just, uh, what's the word? It's amoral. It's, it's, it's not bad or good. It's just something. And so sometimes intervention can be good. Sometimes intervention can be bad. And so I think that in these smaller little jurisdictions, what will happen is it's not like our current system, as I mentioned, whereby if you do not pay taxes or you do not follow the rules and you're going to be put in prison or you're going to face a hefty fine. Instead, under these jurisdictions, it's going to be an opt-in system where, look, you can live in this jurisdiction as long as you follow the rules. If you don't follow the rules, then you can go live somewhere else. And so given that it's opt-in, it's optional, it abides more by this whole free market libertarian idea, which is that you do not force your beliefs on other people. You do not... Uh, interact you do not change someone's kind of trajectory based upon your will uh it's optional and so i think that that is incredibly important to have an opt-in system as opposed to a system built upon force and seizure i mean uh, the, some make the argument even that we are already to a certain extent in this an opt-in system because i can go ahead and like now it needs capital it needs skill it needs uh like the the barriers are still high but I can go out of Austria, I can live in El Salvador, I can, can live in, in America, 
I mean, America is, is, is interesting because when you go out of America, you have an exit tax and, and you, you get taxed all around the world, which I find um, very frustrating, but I'm not American, so I don't care about that. <laughs> but but it's, it's kind of already like an, 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 an opt-in system. How do you like... How, what's uh, next? Like, uh, like we already have like this kind of opt-in system. Uh, is this opt-in system then more in a digital realm where we like we can live in uh, Austria but have different uh, nations that we can adopt to? Like, the, I think Michael Anton Fisher, uh, the author of uh, Bitcoin Nations, uh, kind of had this uh, this vision written in his book where he like it doesn't matter where you live, you can like uh, subscribe to your <laughs> to your country of of will. Uh, or is that too much utopia? It's there's actually uh, what is it? The I think his name is Balaji, uh, and he talks about the network state and how we're kind of trending towards. Which I think he has read quite a bit about, and and Tom Fisher, I believe, from my understanding, he talks a lot about the network state and how as the digital economy is advancing, we're kind of forming these communities not based on physical locale, but instead these digital locales. You could say the Bitcoin community, in a sense, is its own little nation. We have our own beliefs and. Uh, it's interesting. I still very much think that we're still physical in nature. <laughs> I, I, I think that we have got too far away from uh, the physical realm. And unfortunately, we have people in cities dictating what is deemed uh, good for the environment, what is deemed bad for the environment, yet they themselves are sitting on computers in the digital realm. And then farmers are being told they're not allowed to farm when they're the ones providing food for society. And so I lean more towards if I could not use social media, if I didn't have to use social media for the rest of my life, it wouldn't really faze me. Like I, I, I live in the mountains. I would love to spend more time on the land and more time in nature. And so I still very much believe that uh, we'll, we'll predominantly spend most of our life in the physical realm even though increasingly our cognitive capacity is spent in the digital realm. And because of that, I think physical borders are still going to exist for quite some time. Um, and then to your point, I think that we do live in a partially uh, optional environment, partially optional in that the place at which we're born does have immense kind of control over our future and our, our ability to move. And so if I want to go move to another country, there's, Although it is optional to a certain extent, it's very hard for many people. It's very hard for them to leave their country, uh, depending on which country you're born. If you're born in certain third world countries, it's nearly impossible for you to get visas and move into other countries. And even if you're living in a Western country, for you to move, it's very costly. It's very expensive. And so I think that unfortunately with the fiat system, it's allowed for these huge monopolies on control to take place. So you've got a, a government controlling a very large jurisdiction. Whereas I think in a more free market environment, the government will still exist and there will be some overarching rules set by the government. But I think we're going to have a lot more of these smaller jurisdictions within inside these bigger jurisdictions. So it gives us more optionality, even within inside our country. Within Canada, I may be able to move uh, five hours north into a smaller jurisdiction, which is a community that very much more aligns with my values. And so I think that's the way that I see things in the future. But again, it's something that I haven't, I haven't gone deep down this rabbit hole, I wouldn't necessarily say it's my area of expertise. I spend a lot more time in the educational space, given that my background is I, I've been a mountain bike instructor, a backcountry mountain bike instructor, spending most of my time teaching for the last kind of 10 to 15 years. And I've absolutely loved helping people in their educational journey, learn skills. And my passion is always kind of distilling down complex biomechanical movements into their simplest form. And I've now taken that from mountain biking and moved it over to finance and Bitcoin, taking these like complex macroeconomic financial subjects and distilling it down into its simplest form so that people ultimately can feel like, hey, I've got more control over my future. I can better understand which steps to take that maybe will help improve my ability to prosper and support my family and you name it. And so I would say that my area of expertise tends to be more in the realm of education than it does in envisioning these wild futures. But I always think it's interesting having that discussion. Uh, what instructor are you? Like, I did not understand the word. Maybe I'm, I'm lacking English skills here. <laughs> oh, um, like mountain biking. So like mountain, oh, mountain biking. biking. Mountain biking. Sorry, the accent. Cool. Uh, so like you're, you're teaching people how to uh, get, get uh, downhill uh, from the mountain or uphill? Yeah. Yeah. I do, a, I do a mixture of uphill. Well, I used to. I, I don't anymore. I haven't for quite some time. But I used to teach a mixture of 
in the where I live, Whistler, the little ski town that I live in, in the summertime, well, I should say little, it's, it's a, it's a world-class resort. It's an incredible resort. And I feel so honored to live here. And, um, in the summertime, it is the largest bike park in the world. And in the wintertime, it's one of the largest ski resorts in the world. And so I started teaching here when I was in, in my teenage years, and I just absolutely loved it. Like I, I loved being able to support people and get them outdoors. I think that going back to that point about kind of the digital world versus the physical world, I think that the world is trending more and more towards this digital realm. But this digital realm is not making people happy. We've got highest rates of depression and anxiety, of people having migraines, they're staring at screens, their eyesight is dropping off. When you bring people out into the physical world, you get them in nature, you get them in the forest, you see that uh, you see the animals and you get them moving their body. Uh, there's nothing that beats it. I, I think it's one of the best things to do. Thank you. You already made it halfway through the video and I'm really, really grateful to have you here. Two things make this channel possible. You as a watcher and listener who keep supporting this channel. And another one is all the Bitcoin brands that I partner up with, like 21Bitcoin, who support me from the very start and where I personally buy my Bitcoin from. With Code Robin, you even get a discount when you buy Bitcoin with them. And now also Bitbox. Bitbox is the simplest and securest way to secure your Bitcoin. And I heard a crazy statistics. Only 2% of Bitcoiners hold their Bitcoin in a hardware wallet. How crazy is that? Don't be in that 98% bracket. Be in the 2% bracket. And if you have self-custody and you know your friend does not have, maybe he needs a Christmas present. Maybe he needs a birthday present. And a small life hack. If you use code ROBIN, you get 5% off your order. Plus, you support my channel. And and now let's get back to the video. It's fascinating. You see that so many Bitcoiners uh, that I also see, they're like, let's get out. Let's have sun. Let's have mountains. Let's have uh, the ocean. Let's have something in the physical world. And this is like this, this, this digital world it almost incentivizes you to get out and, and, and do something. I sometimes think like uh, a lot of those advantages of, of having Bitcoin are coming now because we are in a really early special kind of a group. We are critical thinkers. We are early adopters. And, uh, the, the 54th uh, uh, percent of, of uh, the world that is adopting Bitcoin is will not have the same effects that the, the first like three, four percent have because it's like a, you're in a different kind of a group. And I think a lot of those complete life changing experience that uh, that people have and even like reported here on the on the podcast a lot uh, come because all of a sudden their environment changes they're like getting out of the normal environment and all of a sudden they are coming to this bitcoin meetups or this bitcoin conferences and they are changing uh, the people around each other but even more than that there is also the the monetary aspect where you all of a sudden you look out in the future because you have a sound money it, it creates a solid foundation i often make this example of like running in in the sand and mud uh, where it's like the fiat system where you like kind of drag down every time you make a step, but you still come forward. Uh, but on the other hand, there's a solid street where you can run uh, on like a Bitcoin standard. You still have to run like on a Bitcoin standard. You just like, you cannot just like do nothing because this proof of work concept, you still have to run. And I love that uh, kind of example. And I'm, I'm, I'm really loving always the conversations like, what is possible on on that solid street versus on the on the mud? Like, what what more can can society do? Like, what what else is the, like? Uh, are we uh, uh, civilizing other planets? Are we what what, what are <laughs> what are we up to? Well, and it, it's interesting you kind of bring up that point, which is, I think that unfortunately, when our money doesn't act as a store of value, everyone is constantly trying to flee the money to go and invest. And there's a big difference, as I mentioned previously, between saving and investing. In a world where we are always striving to get more for less, as Jeff Booth always talks about, we live in this kind of deflationary world where prices should be falling. We're always striving to get more for less. And you can give so many examples. Like one that I always like to think about is like apples. If you think about an apple 200 years ago, to bring an apple to market, you would have to have some guy on his little farm hand kind of till the soil, then he would have to plant the seeds and then he would have to uh, protect his crop and let it grow. And then at the same time, he's also have to, he didn't have fertilizer. He didn't have any really heavy machinery. He would then have to go and hand pick all of this crop. He would then have to horse and cart all the way to the market and then go and sell his apples. Now, 
You've got greenhouses you can grow year round. You've got fertilizers. You've got genetically modified seeds to maximize crop growth. You've got all of this machinery to be able to remove the individual and to be able to harvest thousands of crop in very short amounts of time. And then you've got uh, you've got tankers, you've got uh, ships, you've got you name it to be able to move this uh, move the apples to kind of the the end consumer and. What we should see is because of this obviously advancement te technology, prices should fall. But instead, over the last hundred years, Apple prices have gone up five thousand four hundred and eighty percent. That's just mind blowing. That's not representing the reality of the world at which we live in. And so I think that um, the world we live in should be one where prices fall as technology advances, as productivity increases, as efficiency increases. And because we do not experience that because prices are rising because of monetary intervention, because of uh, monetary in intervention causing inflation. We're now pushed into investing. And so by me being pushed into investing and we're unable to simply just save in the currency, well, all of this time and energy is spent on thinking about money. All of this time and energy is spent on what can I do with my money in order to maximize my ability to make more money. And that, might, that all of that time and energy and we're talking about a whole industry. The whole financial sector is built around trying to make more money. In a free market, I would argue that it would barely exist because people would be able to just save in the currency. And if that whole market did not exist, well, those people would be doing other things. They would be thinking about how do we add value to society? How do I create a business that offers value to society? How do I add, think about like ingenuity and innovation? What can I do in order to add value to society? And so I think that the world we would live in would be a much more prosperous world where we'd be benefiting. So much of our time is artificially spent on just trying to freaking invest, trying to protect our money. And that doesn't, it shouldn't matter. We should be able to simply save and benefit from human ingenuity, human advancement. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I never saw it like that, actually. Like the financial market is kind of the, the biggest zombie market ever because like we, so many so much time is spent on like analyzing some charts analyzing like oh what is what that happens what what if like the industry and it's like it's it's i was in that world um uh, before i was in the stock world and, and i was hearing like what they are doing and what this influence on the stocks is and uh the, the bad thing is like if if you're actually in this world deep and you understand what's going on, you can actually make money from that. And that's why a lot of people do it. And that's a sad part of it, that it actually pays off to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would be so much better if, if people used their time to just like take one financial energy saver like Bitcoin uh, and then uh, whatever they have, like they, they do have their 24 hours, they have to... Uh, sleep they have to eat they have to spend time with the family and the rest of the time where they have uh, the the mental capacity to work and be creative and, and 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 do something for the productive for the world when this is not spent on analyzing some weird lines on a computer it would be really good like it like this this would enable the society to really uh, uh come, come a long way and my question is always like why do not more people get it <laughs> <laughs> like, oh man, I've wholeheartedly, and I think that unfortunately, it's one of those things where it's very hard for people to change their beliefs. And I, I'll, I'll give my mum for example. Going into the pandemic, I think I started to explain to her how our monetary system is influencing all these other areas of society, and she was like, "No, no, no, the the current system's totally fine. Like the government has our best interests at heart." And then as you start to show them more and more evidence. They would the walls would keep going up, and I feel lucky that my mom ended up coming out. I think it was in 2020, in like August of 2020, came out to Canada, and I just said, "Look, sit down with me for like two hours. I'm going to show you some charts, and if you still don't believe anything is happening, the monetary system isn't broken, then we can just we can we cannot talk about it." She was like, "Okay, fine, I'll sit down." And after that two hours, I showed her a few charts, and she was just like, "My God, this is mind blowing," and. That shift allowed her to kind of break down these beliefs. Uh, and from that, she was able to start seeing the world more objectively. But I think for us as humans, unfortunately, we have an ego. And so when we formulate these beliefs and when we attach our ego to these beliefs and we think this is how the world works, it's very hard for us to shift. And that's where I think, unfortunately, uh, as they say in science, what is it? Science advances every time a uh, scientist dies or something like that. And it's it's the same thing in in, in in world beliefs, unfortunately, 
it's the youngest generation that tend to adopt things much quicker because they haven't formulated these hard and fast rules of how the world works. They're able to look at the world more objectively. And so that's where I really admire when we see a baby boomer who is investing in Bitcoin or I was down in Vancouver only this weekend and there was a 77 year old. I was helping him take self custody of his Bitcoin. That is freaking amazing because these individuals have been in this world believing the world works a certain way and they've had to completely upend their belief of the world. And so it's, it's very hard for us to look at the world objectively. But I urge anyone listening to this to really step back and question if I'm getting upset about something, if someone says something to me and it's triggering me, that's not their problem. It's actually my problem. Why, why am I getting upset about this thing? What is it in my ego that is making me put a wall up and not necessarily question what this other person is saying? And so I think it's always important for us as individuals to be curious about the world. The moment we have a belief about something, the moment we defend, we're not being curious. And it's so important to be curious. And I think this trust in third parties and in, in the government in the States, it's still like, first of all, like, Trust is always necessary. Like you're, you're never only depending on you. You always depend on other people and other third parties. Uh, but uh, you can take as much as you can to yourself and, and in your self control. Like just taking your Bitcoin from the exchange to your self control and, and taking self custody of that. That's a big step. That's a big step that you absolutely can do. Um, but there are still like hardware wallet providers involved in that. Like you have to trust them also. Um, I heard a crazy statistic at Bitcoin Prague. Uh, I think from the Treasure CEO, it was uh, coming the statistic that only 2% of Bitcoiners have hardware wallets. And I was like, in this uh, select early group of people that get Bitcoin, and most of them probably are in for the price appreciation and not for the freedom gob technology, otherwise they would have a, a hardware wallet. But even of that small group of people that have Bitcoin, only 2% actually take the self custody, which for me, it's always like when you don't take the self custody and don't have a hardware wallet, uh, then you, you're only in for, for the price appreciation, uh, but not really for, for the freedom go up technology for, for yourself. Uh, and then I'm like, even, even in that select group, uh, m most don't critical think, uh, uh, about the trust of third parties and it's okay if, if you trust a third party, uh, but, uh, it, it's so easy to take self custody. It's not like with gold where you have like, and, uh, you have to physically secure it, like stuff like that. And it's, it's, it's interesting for me to, to, to look at that. It's, you know, what, what comes to mind as you're saying that is that, Unfortunately, the world in which we live in is one where the fiat system plays such a huge, as we've been discussing, such a, a huge role in how we show up in the world. And unfortunately, I think there are many Bitcoiners out there that still look at the world through the lens of fiat. They're still buying Bitcoin in the hopes that Bitcoin goes up so that they can sell Bitcoin back into the fiat world to slightly ease their life. And it's a very fiat mentality. It's, it's what can I do to be able to prevent my savings being debased or i'm just going to invest in bitcoin so it can go up so i can sell it again to kind of support my life and it's a it's a fair way of looking at bitcoin whereas i think that when we go down the rabbit hole where what i truly admire is when people start thinking in bitcoin when people start looking at the world through the lens of bitcoin instead of looking at the world through the lens of fiat and there when we start looking at the world through the lens of bitcoin all of a sudden hey i want to save in this thing because over time my cost of living goes down in relation to bitcoin Oh, sorry. Uh, 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 yeah, in relation to Bitcoin, all of a sudden life becomes easier. And so I'm not going to keep any form of uh, or very little of uh, my savings and fear because I realize it's this thing that's endlessly debasing. So I want to save in the currency that is superior. And I want to look at the world through the lens of Bitcoin, which forces collaboration, forces a free market, separates money from state. And it's under that lens that I think we start to trend more towards a Bitcoin standard. But I would say that when you look at a lot of these statistics, when you see people throwing out that there's like 200 million crypto users and Bitcoin users globally, I, I disagree. I think that I'd be willing to bet that there's probably like a few million. I think there's a few million kind of uh, people kind of down the rabbit hole and even down the rabbit hole of Bitcoiners that start to look at the world through the lens of Bitcoin and not invest in Bitcoin through the lens of fiat. I think there's only 10 to, 10 to 50,000. I think there's very, very, very few. And I think when it comes to custody, kind of to your point, I think that the, the, the thing that makes me feel a little nervous about the future, but we're, we're quickly changing that, is that custody is intimidating. 
And I think that when we're so used to having a financial system whereby we can pop down to the bank, we can set up a bank account uh, relatively easy. We don't have to have any technical expertise. Um, we can then deposit funds into the bank account. We can use it relatively effortlessly. And as long as you're an abiding law abiding citizen that sticks within the rules, it doesn't seem like there's any real friction as to using the traditional system. The problem is, uh, it's when you are an individual uh, and you're in a totalitarian state, when you're in, under authoritarianism, when you're in a government that you no longer align with the government, that you can start to be silenced. And we've seen that even in developed countries, such as the trucker rally during the pandemic. Whereas if you're a Canadian and you didn't agree with what Trudeau was doing, you had the potential to have your, uh, your you silenced financially. You could have your bank account shut down. And so I think that Bitcoin kind of to the custody point of view, the, the challenge right now is that we've got this, this system, the fiat system that's very easy. It's all built around user experience. We've got this Bitcoin system, which you can take custody. It's not overly complex, but the reality is that it's still quite complex. And I think for the average individual, it's a little too complex for the average individual to take custody in a way that they can feel comfortable and sleep well at night. Especially if you live in an apartment, you live with roommates, how can we effectively support people in storing their private keys so they don't feel like there's a risk that if the house burns down, they're going to lose their private key. Or if someone stumbled upon their private key, there's not going to be a risk of loss of funds. And so that's where I do think as time goes by, we're having more solutions, but it is still very hard at the moment. And uh, that that's where I think we need a trend towards a world where we've got more and more Bitcoin developers working on these solutions and it is happening. And we already have a few of those solutions. I often uh, compare it with like the internet adoption when we uh, look back like just 20, 30 years, uh, how hard it was to send uh, information over the internet. Uh, and now my grandma is on WhatsApp. <laughs> like, like everyone can send, send messages, but how hard was it in, in the early days to have to set up and then it got easier and easier and easier. And even like now, like we I have always have this, this small uh, prop device, uh, uh, like, it, it, like for me, it's al already pretty easy. Like you have a harder wallet to set it up. Uh, then if you have a, a higher number of, of, of Bitcoin or like have a, a substantial amount in Bitcoin, makes sense to make like a multi-signature thing. And then you can like, depending on your personal situation, you can go even uh, beyond that and see like, can I distribute the uh, self-custody devices throughout uh, jurisdictions and stuff like that. But that's like more the complicated stuff, but the easy stuff, like just taking your keys, there's a, there's a lot, as you said, to, to think about. Uh, and there's a lot of technology coming. Like uh, I interviewed uh, Sailor on, on, in, in Bitcoin Prague and, and, and he talked about like, what happens if Apple all of a sudden encounters Bitcoin? And he said like, they w uh, want their customers to have the Bitcoin on their devices. They can make chips uh, on, on their iPhones. And then all of a sudden, uh, you can sign a Bitcoin transaction holding your iPhone to your Apple Watch. And then you have your multi-signature thing. I, it's like, I would not recommend that. I, I don't know if Apple ever does that. Uh, I would still recommend having your offline devices. But it's interesting, like uh, in, in the early days of the internet, I heard that uh, people said everyone will have their own email servers. And now everything is running on Gmail. Like, <laughs> the, it, it will be interesting how, how this whole uh, scaling of Bitcoin and, and how, how do we onboard actually really a lot of people? Because to mm -hmm. your point, I also think that there are not a lot of people in Bitcoin. I, since one and a half years, I have a, a Twitter list with Bitcoiners in there. Uh, granted, they are just English Bitcoiners and some German ones, but uh, mostly only English people. And I have a, a Bitcoin list with uh, uh, people that regularly tweet about Bitcoin. And I just have this list. Uh, and I started last year with like 200 Bitcoiners in there. And now they're like 400 in there or something like that, maximum 500. And I'm like, I have really a hard time finding more people for that list. Like it's it's, it's like, oh, and he's already in there. Ah, oh, he's already, and she's already in there. Like there are not a lot of people that actively have Bitcoin and talk about it. And which also then is an indicator, like they're probably not, that many actual Bitcoiners that actually understand it and have the capacity to, to, to think and talk about it. Uh, so yeah, I, I like would be really interesting, for example, like how many people actually have a hardware wallet, how many people uh, actually uh, like like do, do go beyond just like, oh yeah, I have like a thousand or like a hundred euros on uh, some Bitcoin exchange laying around. I think mm -hmm. those people are a lot. 
uh, there are like uh, not uh, not that few but like how many actually did the work and 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 read like or how many people uh bought 10 bitcoin box that would also be an interesting statistic for <laughs> to look at oh man I, I couldn't agree more and what's interesting and this may be a bit more of a kind of a controversial opinion but that is that the way that i see things transitioning is that we need to make as a Bitcoin community, and this isn't obviously me as an individual, but given that I'm not a developer, I don't know how to build a hardware wallet. But as a community, we need to make self-custody incredibly easy. And what will happen is if over time we trend towards a Bitcoin standard, if we make self-custody easy, then we're always going to have a portion of the populace that are going to take self-custody of their Bitcoin. But I also recognize that I think it's naive to believe that we're going to have everybody who is holding Bitcoin take custody of their Bitcoin. However, if we have a Bitcoin standard and Bitcoin is being used in many of these jurisdictions globally, then you're going to have banks that, yes, they allow individuals and they, they're, a bank, they're a Bitcoin custodian and people are going to be using that bank to custody their Bitcoin. But unlike gold, because the challenge with gold is that it's physical in nature and because it's physical in nature, it became cumbersome to store because it came cumbersome to store, people ended up relying on the banks and the banks recognized, hey, no one's coming back to withdraw their gold. So they ended up lending out or giving out more IOUs as opposed to the deposits they had in reserve. And with Bitcoin, if we have an easy way for people to take custody of their Bitcoin, then all of a sudden that disincentivizes banks to fractionalize the amount of IOUs in relation to their reserves. And if they do so, oh, alarm going off. If they do so, you end up with a whole FTX situation where FTX, I think, had something like 1.2 Bitcoin backing $1.6 billion in reserves. Uh, sorry, a billion dollars in liabilities. And so under that situation, they were just like, well, people aren't coming back to withdraw their Bitcoin. Well, people recognized, hey, we don't think, we don't believe you have our reserves. So we're going to withdraw our Bitcoin. And all of a sudden they couldn't facilitate that and they went under. And so I think that if we were to transition to a, uh, a Bitcoin standard, what I do believe is that if Bitcoin, as long as it is easy enough to take custody, then you're always going to get a portion that take custody. But because of that portion that takes custody, the banks have an obligation or they have an incentive not to fractionalize. And so there's still going to be a large portion of people using custodial systems. I wouldn't recommend that now. I don't think we're there yet. I think that the, the, the current system is takes advantage of individuals, takes advantage of deposits, uh, rehypothecates, fractionalizes, you name it. And I think that's also one of the reasons why we're also seeing the suppression of price right now. When you look at the adoption rate kind of like now with Bitcoin, um, would you say like one of, like I see that when, like when we see uh, the whole uh, Bitcoin adoption uh, and how many people still trust all the systems that we have built with the fiat system over the, in the last decades, is the pain just not not high enough? Is is people like ah okay, inflation is high and uh, but it's 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 not that bad. Yes, uh, it's coming down the inflation again. Like I, I hear it a lot. Obviously, I'm living in an Austria bubble. Uh, I'm I, I'm in a quite developed uh, and, and and beautiful country as, as I see it, and there are other people in, in this world. But do you also think that the pain is just not high enough for for people to actually open their eyes? This. I think there's a couple components. I think the first component is that that idea that we talked about previously where people have these beliefs and these beliefs shape their worldview. And it's very hard for them to believe that there's anything sinister about the current monetary system. And because of this, I think people think, well, this is just something that happens and the government is doing its best and the central bank is doing its best. They're just trying to control the system and it's at kind of outside of their bounds of control. And one of the reasons why I believe people think this is from the 1980s and before, the definition of inflation in the dictionary used to be inflation is an increase in monetary units resulting in a rise in prices. Then the government changed the definition of inflation in 1980 onwards to inflation is a rise in prices. So what that allows the government to do is to come out and say, Right now, our number one beast that we're trying to fight is inflation. When in reality, they're the ones who are causing inflation. They're increasing their monetary units, resulting in a rise in prices. And so this is when you see people like Biden get massive support across the whole nation supporting the Inflation Reduction Act where they go and print trillions of dollars. That's completely nonsensical. How do you print money to reduce inflation? It, it doesn't work. And so I think that unfortunately our world has bought into this idea that inflation is this beast that we need to fight, not recognizing that it is the government that is creating inflation. And 
on top of that, it's very hard for people to see outside of the system at which they are in. And I think that's where as Bitcoin is, we recognize that uh, our current monetary system, the fiat monetary system is just one option. There are other options such as Bitcoin, whereas to the average individual, they can't see any of that. They just think that money is the way that it is. We just have to deal with it. And so I think that as time goes by, as the pain increases, at some point, the pain to hold on to our long held beliefs, our, our world beliefs becomes lesser than the pain that we're immediately feeling in terms of, hey, I can't even afford to feed my family right now. And that's where we see countries like Argentina and people start to, you know what, I'm not going to vote for the socialist government. I'm going to vote right because these governments have been promising for so long that they're going to intervene. They're going to support us. They're going to, the economy is going to be great. The future is going to be bright. And I feel like it's the opposite. Life is getting harder and harder and harder. So we're starting to see that. But I think that we're still quite a ways off, given that if you look at Argentina, they've annualized, I think, 60% inflation over the last 50, 60 years. Western countries have annualized 2 to 3% inflation, even though I think that number is far higher. But let's just take CPI. They've annualized 2 to 3% inflation over the last quite a while. So we've got very different inflation numbers to something like Argentina, and Argentina has just flipped. And we should not forget, uh, I think Jeff Booth makes a wonderful work in that, that we have a massive force of deflation, like a massive deflationary force with the advancement in technology, with advancement in AI and advancement with robotics and everything like that. This, this drives actually prices down a lot. Uh, so like this inflation rate of like, oh, we have now like 5% higher uh, prices. First of all, like they manipulate what comes in that basket. And then this pass is actually drawn down by, by technical advancements. So like uh, it's, it's, uh, it would be interesting, like uh, without that uh, massive infl deflationary force, we would have inflation rates of 40, 50 percent. We would actually the inflation rate of the uh, monetary expansion. And this is, uh, this is a thing where uh, I, I never heard that with the, that the change the definition of inflation from like uh, it's about the price not about uh, in inflating the, the units uh, really interesting to see yeah it's, you know what it's this point you mentioned about Jeff I listened to a talk with Jeff I think it was on what Bitcoin did this was probably three years ago and it was one of those really like aha moments I'd read the price of tomorrow previously but this is just one of those moments that really clicked and he was saying that when we think about inflation and we see the CPI of say two, 3%, what we're forgetting is that we're not measuring from the zero bound. If inflation is minus five, minus 10% year over year over year because of advancements in technology, then if we've got inflation of 3%, but it's actually meant to be minus 10, then it's actually 13%. And so I think that many of us look at it and think, well, inflation of 3%, that's from the zero bound. No, because prices should, as you say, they should be falling. And the other point is that when you really start digging into CPI, you just realize how manipulated it is. You look at things like hedonic adjustments. A Honda Civic over the last, I think, 30 years through CPI has stayed exactly the same price. But the reason why they can get around saying it stayed exactly the same price when actually the car has gone from probably 5,000 to 15,000 to 30,000 is because each time you have a new model released, there's slight little changes to it. There's a little bit of technological advancement. And they say, well, if, if last year it was 27,000 and this year it's 30,000, well, because you now get uh, an upgraded sat-nav system, that accounts for that extra 3,000. So the actual inflation, when you take into account technological advancement is zero. And so this is how they say, well, prices have not risen. And then the other thing that I think people don't quite understand is that because um, inflation is a basket of goods, if those individuals in society are going and buying grass-fed beef and they're able to afford grass-fed beef, but then all of a sudden prices start to rise and they can't quite afford grass-fed beef anymore. So then they go and buy the Impossible Soy Burger instead. So they transition from grass-fed beef to the Impossible Soy Burger, which is far cheaper. What ends up happening is the basket changes because they're saying consumer preferences are changing. No, consumer preferences aren't changing. It's because they can't afford grass-fed beef. So what ends up happening is that the basket doesn't um, it doesn't indicate a rise in prices because they're just saying consumer preferences are changing. And so we never see the rise in prices of people transitioning from one product to another because they can't afford the old product. And so CPI inflation is, is so misleading. It is far, far, far higher. If you look at, I'm just trying to remember, there is, I can't quite remember the name of the site. There's a website that looks at 
some of the old ways they used to measure CPI. And if you go and look at CPI from the 1970s and use that same basket of goods today, inflation is sitting in the high teens or low 20s. Is there a metrics that you that you look at uh, that the most accurately uh, describes uh, the inflation rate right now? Uh, it's, it's challenging because inflation in general is a misnomer. Inflation is unique to the individual person. What I spend my money on is different to what you spend your money on. And so for me, I like mountain biking. I like the outdoors. And I want to try and buy a small little farmstead in the future if Bitcoin does its thing. I want to buy a small little farmstead. Whereas for you, you probably look at different things. And so inflation is unique to the individual. And so as a society, when we try to uh, come together and say inflation is this value, it's a useless metric. And um, unfortunately, that useless metric is, is, is governing how we direct central planning. It's how we direct the, the freaking the central banks, the government. And so I think that it is something that under a free market, it doesn't exist. It only exists under central planning. But to your point, there is that website and I can always find it and send it to you and you can put it in the show notes. There is a website and I've completely blanked on the name of it um, that looks at CPI through traditional ways of measuring. And what you recognize as CPI is a hell of a lot higher. They just constantly adjust CPI in order to minimize the inflation rate or the perceived inflation rate. I only know about true inflation. I don't know if you mean that, but probably it's something else. I think it's something else. Uh, definitely. It, it's always interesting for me when you look at inflation. And obviously, it's, it's different. Like when when you <laughs> when you live in someone's basements, you don't have to pay rent. Uh, you, you only watch Netflix, and, and and that's all what you're doing. Uh, your inflation, like you don't care about inflation. <laughs> <laughs> the subscription uh, cost of Netflix will not go up uh, uh, too much. Uh, so like, but if you want, especially if you want uh, a good life, if you want to have like, go in a good restaurant, eat that good steak, uh, go on this, buy maybe a house near like a good neighborhood or like a, ne next to a lake, all of a sudden you have an actual inflation rate uh, of like 50, 60, maybe a hundred percent, depending on, on what kind of, 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 of life do you want. So, It's like, uh, yes, you, you, you can minimize your, your life to a certain extent where you don't have much inflation. Inflation doesn't bother you. But, uh, if, if you actually like, uh, want anything in life, then it's more like on a 50, 60, 70%. And even if you're just a normal human being, your inflation rate, uh, is, is, is quite high with like, I don't know, in the, the low teens or, or, or whatever the, the inflation rate is. Plus then, as we covered before, the, That we're starting from the zero and we should start from like minus 10 minus 15 or something like that yeah really interesting um i i could uh, go on and talk with you like uh <laughs> on hours on end uh but uh, l let's come uh, slowly to to our end routine uh which is now two questions and the first question uh this that i always ask uh, bitcoiners on my podcast now is Uh, I asked that question because I think Bitcoiners are unique persons and we are in an early group and we can learn from each other and benefit from each other. And that's why I'm asking, what are you currently passionate about or deeply learning about besides Bitcoin? What am I learning about besides Bitcoin? Okay, you know what? So I've always been fascinated in just kind of how we learn. I think that we're never taught in school how we learn. We're just kind of taught to kind of consume information and regurgitate information. Tests many times are just us learning how to regurgitate information, but that doesn't actually mean we understand the information. And so I think as an educator, as someone who has written books, as someone who started the Looking Glass Education, our platform where we basically create content for Bitcoiners learning about how the world works, I always want to try and improve people's engagement, improve people's learning effectiveness. Uh, and one of the things that I've been looking at is as individuals, when we're interested in something, it sparks that fire in our uh, in our mind. And this is kind of this flow state that people talk about. And when we're in this flow state and we're interested in something, our capacity to learn is immense. When we're out of that flow state, when we're not really interested in something, it's very hard for us to learn. And the problem with traditional academia and traditional ways of learning is that you have a very linear way of learning. You do module one, you do module two, you do module three, you do module four. And if you find any of these subjects boring, well, you're stuck kind of approaching it this, this very linear way. And so... At the moment, I've been, since February, I've been working for a company based out of, uh, it's about five hours from me here in Canada, called Block Rewards. And we are, we want to help support individuals basically be paid and compensated in Bitcoin. 
and I want to be able to uh, create an educational journey for users of our platform and hopefully for other users making a lot of free content as well. I want to be able to create an educational journey that's quite dynamic. And so that dynamic learning journey allows individuals to go at their pace and to jump around in a way that more easily represents how we actually learn, which is a when we find something interesting, we go and explore that topic. And then we go back and then we continue. And then we find something else interesting, we go and explore this topic. And so one thing that I'm interested in right now is trying to figure out the most effective way to be able to create more of these dynamic adaptive learning journeys to be able to improve education and engagement. Because I think so much of our traditional academia, so much of our online courses, so much of the content we consume is far too linear, which just causes people to drop off. We, we lose engagement. We don't really find it interesting. And not only that, but when you have a linear learning journey, if you're an economist and you and then another person is, say, a mother of three kids and you're reading the same course, well, how do you keep engagement? Because what you want out of the course, your pain points, what resonates with you is so different. And so that's where having these kind of more dynamic, adaptive learning journeys, hopefully will allow a broader subset of individuals to be able to consume the same content. It's just they're consuming it in different ways from different angles. And that's that's something that I'm really passionate about, trying to support people in their learning. Uh, that's, a, that's an amazing thing and education is so underrated like uh when we go in this uh in, in this world out and everyone is like oh i i don't i hate learning i no you don't hate learning you hate the educational system that you grew up in like <laughs> learning is something amazing i, I love it so much it's like I, I i wish i had like even more time to learn it which is fascinating to have the podcast because I can actually learn from you now and I can learn from other people. And that's, that's, that's a great thing. Like learning is the, the most rewarding thing you can do in, in, in this world. I, I highly appreciate that you, you brought up this topic and, and, uh, and I highly, I, and also agree a lot with that. Well, and um, it's, I, was, I was just going to add as well, like it's interesting because when you are in conversation with someone, you are learning in a dynamic way. Because if someone, you're going down an avenue and someone starts talking about something and you're like, hey, you made this point that was really interesting. I'm curious, can you expand on that? And that's just this dynamic way. We're not linearly learning. We're not just listening to the person monologue at us for an hour and a half. We're able to jump in and out of the areas that we find interesting. And so it's, if we're able to just support people in their learning, I think we're going to have a world where people are so much more engaged. People also have much deeper knowledge in their respective areas. And what's helped me immensely as an individual is, and I feel so lucky about this because I dropped out of school when I was 14. I hated school. I, I really, really struggled with it. And when I kind of hit my late teens, I could honestly, I, maybe up until 2022, I could count the amount of books I'd read on one hand. Like I had barely read anything, but I was very passionate about learning in biomechanical movements. I wanted to learn how to do a backflip on a bike. I wanted to learn how to do a corner. I wanted to learn just different ways of learning. And in my kind of early 20s, I really started to recognize, man, I, I freaking love learning, but I want to figure out how to learn about the financial markets and how to learn about the world around me and psychology, you name it. And what helped me immensely was I started to take notes on what it is that I was learning. And I took notes. And so now I feel very lucky when I wrote The Hidden Cost of Money, the book we talked about, when I wrote The Hidden Cost of Money, if you go to the back of the book, I think there's 500 citations. And those, there's so many, there's that many citations because I had 10 plus years of all of these books that I've read and I was able to reference them in all of my notes. And so I, f I feel really lucky to have been able to find my ability to learn the way that I learn. And I urge anyone listening to this to, if you're not interested in learning, find how you learn. Pick up on what it is that makes you tick and the things that you're interested in. Because once you find your way of learning, the world is a freaking fascinating place. And I should also say, if anyone's listening to this that has experience in creating like dynamic educational journeys or feel free to reach out because I'd, I'd love to chat. Uh, really, really cool. And I, I usually ask that question uh, after the uh, after the endotene question, but uh, where can people find you? Where can people ask you questions uh, and, and reach out to you? For sure. Um, so you can just check me out on Twitter, which is just Seb Bunny, S-E-B-B-U-N-N-E-Y. Um, you can also check out Looking Glass Education, which is, I founded it. And I think you actually had a talk with uh, Daz B. So Daz B is like, he's my business partner. We founded Looking Glass with Greg Foss and a couple others um, about four or five years ago. And our whole goal is just basically to distill down uh, macroeconomics, finance, Bitcoin, for the lay person to still it down into kind of jargon free content and we have a mixture of free courses uh and materials and then outside of that i do have a website sebbunny.com 
Um, and that whole website, I kind of just have my podcasts. I have the, the books that we've written, you name it. But yeah. Amazing. Perfect. And let's come to our end routine uh, where the previous guest is asking a question uh, for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Uh, and the question for you is, aside from owning Bitcoin, what's something you do or have done to enhance uh, your sovereignty? Hmm. That's a really good question. There's a couple different things that I am thinking about. You could approach that question from a couple of different ways. The first way that I'm thinking about approaching it is, you know, so I discussed this idea that I was a mountain biker for a long time. When I first started teaching mountain biking, I quickly recognized that um, these individuals that I was working with as a kid, I idolized them. They were in these massive mountain bike movies. They were kind of like the, the, the tiger woods of the mountain bike world. And many of them were struggling financially. Many of them, they didn't have uh, enough income to be able to purchase a property. They were up to their neck in credit card debt, but they were supposedly living the dream and they were on the world stage. And this made me recognize that, you know what, if I, if I want to be able to pursue the life that I want to be able to live, if I want to be able to be a mountain bike instructor, I have to have passive income streams. And so I think that as individuals, although I have a lot of weight of my portfolio in Bitcoin, what really helped me immensely was recognizing that if, if my only way to earn money is through my day job, then that means I have to work in order to be able to earn money. And so I ended up um, investing in real estate. And it's obviously a lot harder these days, given the, the cost of real estate. But I feel so lucky that I ended up investing in real estate when I was younger. I, I think purchased my first place when I was 19. And having those passive income streams allowed me to be able to pursue things that actually motivated me, given that I didn't have to expend time and energy to be able to just earn money and earn a paycheck. And so I urge anyone to be able to think about how do you create passive income streams? That way you can have more time to be able to pursue the things that motivate you. And honestly, if it wasn't for my real estate, I wouldn't have been able to write The Hidden Cost of Money. I spent a year writing that book, probably 30 hours a week writing that book. And as, as you guys probably know, when you're writing a book, you're not getting paid to write a book. And, uh, to be honest, even writing a book is not a massive monetary endeavor. I, I wrote it because I wanted to give something back to the community and to share my opinions. And so being able to have passive income streams is something that's very important to me. Um, and the challenge now that I find is, okay, if I have real estate and Bitcoin, well, I'd rather have Bitcoin, but Bitcoin doesn't provide a passive, in <laughs> passive uh, income stream. So now I've sold most of my real estate and rolled it into Bitcoin. But I still think that if, if you have the potential to build passive income streams, whether it's through real estate, whether it's through business, that's, that's incredibly important. And then outside of that, in terms of sovereignty, I would also say not only on kind of the monetary front, but I think that working on yourself as an individual is so incredibly important. I don't think we quite understand as to how much our childhood environment shapes how we show up. All of us like have faced trauma. Trauma is subjective. Some people think, oh, I had to have had some heinous upbringing in order to have trauma. That's not necessarily true. We can have trauma that we don't even remember. Uh, if we'd never injured ourselves, and at the age of 10 years old, we roll our ankle, that in itself could be traumatic. And so I think that doing personal work on ourselves, understanding how we are showing up in the world, understanding our own emotional triggers, our relationships with our parents, gives us more sovereignty over our ability to show up whole, wholeheartedly and authentically and not responding from the past. And so I really urge anyone, if you want to grow in this world, to build our relationship with ourself, build our relationship with our inner child, build our relationship with our parents. And, uh, and, and I think that that helps us show up more authentically uh, without responding from the past, which many of us are stuck kind of responding from trauma, responding from the past. Uh, I love it a lot, this answer. It, it... It's like I, I, I'm tempted to open like a, a whole new topic, but I think uh, we, we can make a second round in half a year, a year or something like that uh, to have all those open topics discussed. And yeah, thank you for, for being on, uh, Seb, and for everyone watching and listening. Seb, uh, thank you for watching, and I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Thanks, Cameron. I really appreciate it.